Hello, can you hear me all right? Good morning. Um, or if you are on East Coast time like I am, good afternoon to you. Um, my name is Zoe. Like Ryan said, I build client WordPress and some, some Shopify sites. Um, I mostly work in the sort of lifestyle brand niche, which is small creative businesses, bloggers, stuff like that. Um, and basically what I do all day every day is I build themes. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today and some of the things that I have done to automate my workflow process that I think might be helpful to others of you who are building themes day to day. Um, so first, before we talk about how you automate, I wanna talk about why you might want to automate. And I think this is a big topic because like Ryan kind of alluded at, there's a ton of tools out there right now. So there's Grunt, Gulp, Post CSS, a million things, and there's a new one every day. And so it can be really hard to kind of figure out what the motivation is to make use of all these tools in your workflow and what to use and when and why and how. So let's start with that. So really the question is why wouldn't you wanna automate? Um, one of the arguments I hear a lot is that a, everyone's doing it, it's like this herd of people going towards the latest, greatest, coolest tool. That's kind of lame, I don't want to just go to a tool because it's cool. That's a reason, that's the reason that I have used myself a number of times with new tools that have come out. Um, another one that's similar to that is that it's sort of like this robot taking over my job thing, like I'm a person who's good at my job because I know how to code well, and I don't want tools coming in and trying to take over my job, basically. Which, is, yeah, valid, okay, I can see why that would be, that would be a, a concern. Um, I like this quote a lot, which is that um, problems that we have are not really about how machines think, but whether men or women or people think. And machines are really as good as, as how you use them and how you make use of the tools that are available to you. So I like to think of all of these automation tools as um, little bonuses that I can add into my workflow where it makes sense and not tools that need to come in and take over every piece of my work that I do. So, the way that I go about integrating these tools is by making notes of my process. So as I'm working on a day-to-day -day basis, I write down what I'm doing. A lot of the time that ends up being blog posts for me, which I think is really helpful for other people. So I encourage you to do that, to blog about your, your process. But also what it does is it helps me realize all the ridiculous steps that I take with every time I create a new theme. And it helps me see where things are annoying or painful. So sometimes they're actually painful, but more often they're just annoying. So it's like I'm going to go through and find and replace all the strings in this starter theme I'm using every single time I create a new theme. That's annoying, and it's not something you have to do. So identifying those by writing down your process is the first step. The other kind of argument that I hear a lot about this is that there's just too much to learn. There are too many things coming at me all the time, I can't learn them all. So that's cool, but I think when you look at your process and you think about the pain points, what you can do is you can think about it in terms of replacing things with technology that makes it feel a little bit more magical. So if there are things in your workflow that are annoying, the automation is an opportunity to replace them with things that feel kind of cool and fun and magical. So that, that's kind of a mindset shift that I've used to get my, myself a little bit more excited about some of these tools as well. And so that's what the goal of the tools that I'm gonna show you are, it's to make pieces of your workflow feel a little bit more magical. Because I think one of the things that I really love about being a developer is, is that kind of magic, where I get to write some code and then have something come out of that code that does cool things and looks really nice and, and it makes people enjoy the internet a little bit more. So let's talk about how you can go about automating. So there are sort of three phases of my workflow that I, that I think about when I think about automating, and these are them. So there's project setup. So I'm gonna start a whole new theme project. I need to get all of my files in order. Then there's the active work project. So that's when I'm actually writing my CSS, my template files, all that good stuff. And then there's a piece of this which is deploying code. So we're gonna look at those uh, piece by piece and we're actually gonna start with the active work phase. So when I think about active work and I think about the parts of my workflow that are painful or annoying, these are some of the things that come to mind. So what I used to do was I used to have one mega style, that CSS style sheet that had a million different things in it. And um, I had my own sort of like partial variable system where I would find and replace for a particular string that was a color value, for example, so like text color. If it was in multiple place, I would have literally the word text color, and then I would find and replace for that. Um, and I had to do that every time I created a new theme. So last year, I think I built somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 websites for client work, so that's a lot of finding and replacing. <laughs> Not a good use of time. Um, another thing is, is figuring out browser prefixes. So those change constantly, and I don't know what they are off the top of my head. So having to look those up on the regular is also a hassle. And then there's a whole like, set of automated tasks like optimizing images. Um, if, you have, if you have JavaScript, you want to lint that. 
you want to minify your CSS and your JavaScript. So all these kinds of um, rote tasks come up in my active work a lot. And these are all things that I was thinking, well, there's probably a better way to do it. And there are. There are many better ways to do this. Um, a few of them are things like preprocessors. So a lot of you are probably familiar with things like SAS or LESS. Um, there's one called PostCSS. It's a little different. That's a newer one. This is just a way to get rid of some of those pain points by using things like partials. So that's breaking your style sheet into smaller modular files and then including them all into one file when you process it. Um, it includes things like nesting. So this is an example where you can um, judiciously use this to uh, as associate your styles with each other and to create um, a cascade in your styles in a way that's visually really accessible when you're writing your code. Um, this is something that you, you do need to be careful with because you can get a little crazy with your nesting, but it's a nice feature in terms of organizing your code as you write it and keeping things clear for your own purposes. And then it also includes variables. So that lets you do that thing, like I said, where I was finding or replacing. It lets you actually create variables and use them in your style sheets. Um, these are only three of the many features that SAS has, but that's kind of the point, I think, for me, is that you don't have to use all the features that all the tools have. Um, I held off on SAS for a long time because I felt like I didn't need a lot of the things it had. I didn't want to learn them. But what I finally figured out is that I was already kind of trying to do this variable thing in my own files, so why not use a tool that actually does it for real instead of doing my own sort of mixed model way? Um, and so that's how I'd encourage you to think about all tools, and I think it kind of ties back to that idea of perfectionism that we heard about before, which is that you don't have to do things all the way 100% all the time. You can use a tool for whatever you need it for, and, and that's, that's great. That's what it's for. It's a tool for you, not something that you need to adopt full scale or not at all. Um, along with SAS, there's a really cool tool that I like to use called Auto Prefixer. Um, what this does is exactly what it sounds like, and it's really popular, so you may have heard of it. Uh, what it does is it runs through your CSS and it finds everything that might need a browser prefix using Can I Use This database, so it's always up to date, and it automatically adds in all your browser vendor prefixes. That's pretty awesome. You don't ever have to remember them. You just write the, the like normal standard version and it will go through that database and it will find the current prefixes. And what's cool about that is that if you run your code again in a couple months, it will adjust that so that you don't have extra prefixes left over that you don't need anymore. Um, so that's a really cool tool that I use after SAS. And you don't have to use SAS to use that. It's a separate thing that just reads through CSS and, and assigns these things. Um, that's where I kind of think of the magic coming in, right? Like, that's, that's cool. Like, that's easy. It's magical. It takes a burden off of me. And if a guy balancing eggs on a knife is not magic, I don't know what is. Um, the thing is that once you start using these tools, you need a way to process your files because they don't just happen. You need to actually process through either your SAS files or your LESS files. You need to process through your CSS files. Well, there are a variety of tools for that as well. So these are three of the very popular ones. So um, there's Grunt, which is the warthog guy, Gulp, and then CodeKit is a Mac app that does this as well that has a, a nice user interface if you don't want to do it on the command line. And basically all three of these tools just take your files and they run whatever processes you want to run on them. So personally, I use Gulp for this. Um, again, this is one of those things where I think it's just choose one that looks interesting to you and try it um, and see what it does for you. So when you use Gulp, all this adds to your project is you add a Gulp file, which is your configuration file, and you add a package file, which tells Gulp what packages you're going to use. Um, this is an example of a package file, so it just tells you, this is my uh, project, which is the repository stuff at the top. Um, and then it tells you all the different packages within Gulp that you want to use. So um, basically it's saying, for this example, that I want to use Gulp itself. I want to use Gulp's Ruby SAS compiling tool. I want to use Auto Prefixer. I also want to minify my CSS, and then I want to live reload. Um, and live reload is a pretty cool tool. If you haven't used it, it lets you uh, save your files, compile them, auto prefix them, minify them, and then it automatically reloads your local site in your browser without a refresh. So typing away over here, all my processes run, and my browser is automatically updating as I go with my style changes with no moves on my part. So this is a super simple example that would do all of the CSS things that I just mentioned in one run, basically. This is what my package file would look like. So then if we look at a gulp file, um, zoom out a little bit. This is what it would look like. Again, this is a, a simplified example that is really only looking at the CSS tasks, just to give you an idea of what this looks like and how, how you read it. Um, 
I, I am not a JavaScript developer. I know like enough JavaScript to be dangerous and enough jQuery to write things into themes. But um, I, this, I did not know any of this before I started using it. And, and I think that's, that's important to say because it's pretty straightforward, I think, and pretty easy to understand what you're doing and to play with it without needing to feel like you are a JavaScript developer if you're not. So this is what my gulp file would look like. At the top, it's basically mimicking that package file. So it's just saying, these are all the things that I'm going to use in the rest of my file. I need to require all of these, these packages to be present before I can run this. So then the way it's set up is that each task is a thing that you want to run on your project. So you can see here, my task is called styles. Um, and this is all about my style sheet. So the first return SAS line is saying, let's look in the SCSS folder. And we're going to run the SAS process on that. That compiles all of my, my SAS files into CSS. Um, it gives you the opportunity to give yourself some error messages if you go wrong. Um, if you are like me, I, I actually enjoy editing my error messages to give me at errors that I find amusing. So that's another way to add a little joy. I didn't do that in this example, but feel free. Um, and then what it does is it just runs through all the pipes. And each of those things acts on my files in sequence. So I process my SAS, and then it goes to the next pipeline. And that moves my process style sheet to the root, because as we know, you need your style sheet to be in the root of your theme folder for it to work. Uh, so that moves it to the root out of my SCSS file folder. Then it runs auto prefixer. Then it minifies my CSS for me so that I have a nice, quickly moving CSS file. Um, and then the next one I think is actually extraneous. It moves it to the root again just to make sure that's where we are. I think it's already there, so I could probably delete that. And then it runs the live reload, which is that browser reload for my local dev site. So that's cool. So that's the actual task that's going to run. Um, and then what you can do is you can assign additional tasks, like this watch task down at the bottom. So this is saying, um, when I run this watch task, I want to watch my SAS files. So that is these files right here. I'm going to watch all of these files in this folder, and I'm going to run that styles task that we just looked at every time that I make a change. So in practice, what this looks like is that um, you can either, in your terminal app or whatever you use for command line, you can run gulp styles, and that just runs that styles tasks. It runs that whole list of things in that pipe, just one after another. So that runs it once. Or alternately, you can run gulp watch, and that runs continuously, and it watches those files that I just showed you, so all the SAS files. And every time I save a change, it runs all of those things in that task. So that is automated completely. So what I have open, what I'm working is I have my, style, my SAS files in Sublime, usually, and then I have Gulp Watch running on the side. And so every time I save, it's all processed, prefixed, everything, and my browser reloads for me. So I don't ever have to take my hands out of Sublime. I'm just sitting there typing away, changing things, and then watching my stuff reload on the side. As it goes, everything's processed for me automatically. That's pretty nice. That actually saves me a quite a bit of time, not toggling back and forth between different windows and running things and running processes. Um, over, over the course of a year, I'd say it saves me probably at least a, a day, probably more than that. I should probably calculate that one of these days, and I will. But it saves me, it saves me a good amount of time to just run that while I'm going. So that's the, the stuff while I'm actually working that I use the most. And there are other things you can do. Like, like I said, you can minify all your images. So you can set it up to watch an image directory. And every time you drop a new JPEG in there, it will minify or it will compress that JPEG for you automatically. So there's a lot you can do with it. That just scratches the surface. Um, next, looking at project setup. So this is another one that I've spent a lot of time on. So some of the tasks that I was doing a lot with this, and I wrote a blog post about this, and it ended up being something like 10 different tasks for setting up a new theme every single time. So some of them were, I usually work from a starter theme, so you have to actually go get the starter theme, wherever that's on GitHub or wherever you get it from. Um, you may have to replace strings throughout with your own themes and name and namespacing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then if you're using all of those Gulp SAS type tools, you have to install all those packages through NPM, which is the Node Package Manager. So those are just three of the steps that I was taking regularly. So in order to get rid of all of those, I came across this tool called Yeoman, which is probably my favorite thing, um, partly because of the, the dapper gentleman with the mustache who greets you. Um, and this is a, a generator. So you can set up your own tools to generate any kind of project you want. So at first, I was a little intimidated because, like I said, I'm not a JavaScript developer. And most of the examples are huge JavaScript projects, 
huge. So that was a little intimidating. And there are some that generate entire WordPress installs as well. So that's kind of cool. But I use it on the theme basis. So it took me a little while to figure out how that works. But what it does, once I got it, was pretty cool. So what you do, basically, is you start with a folder. Let me show you this. So you start with the folder. So for example, if I have this themes folder, that's going to be my working folder where all my themes are going to live. What I can do is in my command line tool and terminal, I can make sure that I'm inside that folder. And then I can just run yo emmy. Emmy is the name of the starter theme that I created that uses all these tools, which is what I use to start all of my projects. And uh, yo emmy runs the generator that I built for that theme. So I type that in. And it pulls up some really sweet art that I spent. Probably negated all the time saved with the gulp watch by creating this art. <laughs> um, but it makes me happy every time I see it, so so well worth it. And what it does is it runs through a series of questions that I've set up in the generator. And it asks me things like, what do I want to name my theme? So I'm going to call this sample theme. And you can name it whatever you want. And it says, who built the theme? So it's asking me the questions that come up at the top of my style, that CSS file, basically. Uh, it has some defaults set, or you can type in new values for each of those. And once you're done with all your questions, um, it says, OK, I'm going to go get that, that starter theme from GitHub, which is the latest version. It grabs it, it downloads it, and then it runs npm install, which is installing all the files. You can see if I go back to my directory structure here, it's actually created my sample theme folder with the correct name based on what I entered for my settings. It's downloaded all my theme files from GitHub. Um, it has started installing all the node modules that I need to run Gulp, that we just looked at in that Gulp package file. So that's all ready for me. And then the last thing it does is it actually runs the Gulp styles task, and it creates my style sheet with the correct info in the top. So when it's first downloading and running the style.css, is actually empty. But once it runs, and once it's finished, you can see I have my minified style sheet, which has all my sort of basic stuff that I use. And it has, at the top, the, the information that I entered when I was configuring the theme. Um, and it, you can go ahead and, you, and this is able to be activated at this point. It, doesn't, it looks pretty nasty because it's just a starter theme and there's not much in there. But it is a functioning WordPress theme that I can then go in and work on to customize however I want. So that's pretty cool. Like you can see that ran really fast. I didn't have to do anything other than run the initial command and tell it some answers about how I wanted things to be configured. And I have my new theme. Um, so, so that's Yeoman. Um, this generator that I just showed you and my starter theme are both uh, on GitHub if you want to check them out. But I did want to quickly show you the, um, what the file looks like that creates the generator. This one, I'm not going to lie, this took me like a solid few days of messing around and breaking stuff in JavaScript to figure out. But um, you're welcome to take mine and, and configure it for your own theme. And so basically what this does is it looks somewhat similar, is it requires a bunch of stuff that makes this run. And then it goes through a series of tasks. So those are identified by things like this initializing grouping. Um, and what it does is it just goes through the tasks one at a time. And Yeoman has a, an order of tasks that it has set up in its system. So it goes ahead, and first it requires some information, and then it starts sending me those messages. It includes my really awesome art right here. That's this line, 14. Um, and then it goes through, and it prompts me to answer all of those questions that I set up. So you can come in here, and you can easily come in, and you can add um, a new block to add a new question if you want to ask something else. So like I've been trying to figure out how to make it ask me if I want to automatically add this to Git, for example. Um, and so I could add another question in here that it is, do you want to? Uh, check in this project with git at the end and then I can assign that answer to a variable and then it comes through and it goes through all those variables and this is where it's finding and replacing all that information in the actual style sheet and actually does it across all of the theme files so it, it is going into um, all of my files and it's adding in the the correct text domain and the correct like namespacing all that kind of stuff in the entire theme for me so that's that part of the generator um, and then it goes through and it, it tells me that it's getting the file from GitHub. So it's actually pulling down the latest version so I don't have to go through and update my template all the time. Um, and then it goes through and does all that finer in place and spits out the commands at the end to run Gulp. So this one configuration tool runs that whole process and it's something that I can go in and I can update and edit as I want to ongoing.
So that's Yeoman. So what, basically what I do is I run my Yeoman, set up my project, then I use my Gulp watch task while I'm working, and then we get to deployment. I'm not gonna go a whole ton into deployment because that is, as you probably know, there are a million ways to handle this. We heard about um, one tool uh, yesterday in some of the workshops that you can use to have your dev server and your local, and keep those all in sync. Um, but I did want to point out a few, a few tools. So um, one is that Git is key because it protects your files. So I use Git for this. So I, I do this still at the theme level because that's what I do is I build themes. I don't need to track an entire WordPress installation or plugins ever. So I just track things at the theme level. Um, and then there are a couple of tools. I actually use both of these right now. I need to consolidate a little bit. They're called deploy.io and then deployhq.com is the other one. Um, and these are both uh, paid services that let you link up a Git or or Bitbucket or any number of repositories to a server somewhere. So you can set it up to an FTP, SFTP, SSH. There's a whole variety of things. You can do it with Shopify, which is pretty sweet, um, only on deploy.io right now. Um, and basically what it does is it, you can set it to either automatically deploy or to deploy manually. If it's a live site, obviously you want it to be manual. But if it's set to automatic, like if you're in development, every time you push a new commit to your repo, it automatically deploys to your server. So that's pretty nice too, because if I'm working on a development site, that lets me st still stay in Sublime. And there's a really nice Sublime plugin that's called Sublime Git. Um, it's like a recommended don donation of like 15 bucks or something really cheap. And that lets you run your Git commands right in Sublime. So literally, you never have to move your hands off of Sublime. You're in Sublime, and you are just typing and changing your code. Your watch task is running. You're ready to push. You use Git in Sublime to push your code, and it automatically deploys to a development site that somebody on your team or your client can see. So that's, that's how I run deployment. And like I said, there's a lot of ways to do that, and that's just one. And this is really what it looks like. So you commit something, and then you push it, and then it deploys. Um, so we talked a little bit about how time is a big barrier for this. And, and the way that I handle those time constraints when I want to learn new things is I do what I call level up days. Um, and so uh, sometimes those are on the weekend. But usually I try to schedule them into my work week, because if they're on the weekend, I have two little kids. And it is much harder to level up when there's Sean the Sheep going on in the background. Um, <laughs> but I pick a day, basically, and I say, I'm going to dedicate this day to just banging around in something new. I'm going to choose a problem in my workflow. I'm going to spend a couple hours this day, and I'm going to read a ton of blog posts and break things for a while and not worry about it. And at the end of that day, hopefully I'll have a new skill that I can use in my workflow. Um, if you want to level up with some of these tools, um, you have to install a lot of things, but I promise you that they are easy to install, and I have a helpful list here which you can find in the slides, which are published elsewhere as well. Basically, all you have to do is install all the tools, and then there are a ton of resources out there, so you can grab a project that exists and play around with it, which is my preferred way to learn. So Yeoman, for example, you can go in and they have a list of community generators. You can type in WordPress, and you get a list of everything from entire WordPress installations you can generate, that way to things like individual themes or plugins. Um, or you can grab my project and play around with it if you want to do that as well. The theme itself is on GitHub, and then also the generator is on GitHub as well. They are two separate things, so that you can use the theme without the generator if you don't want to quite go into that yet. Um, but the moral of the story is basically that if there are things in your workflow that you don't love, that's an opportunity, I think, instead of feeling annoyed to replace it with something that feels a little bit more magical. And a lot of these tools are things that I've chosen to make my workflow feel a little bit more like magic. Thank you.